Battle, battlefield arm, nuclear arms the Russians had. Plus the commander I heard later in, in Cuba was the Stalingrad, one of the Stalingrad commanders. So you knew that they were going to fight. So where are we now? It's a strange time and you know it as well as I do because you worked in the high levels of Washington. You saw the thinking. It's so scary because it's so ignorant. When Congress passed those sanctions with I think two dissensions in the Senate, very few in the House. It shows you that they don't know anything. The Congress people, the congressmen of the United States are very ignorant of the underlying stories here. They're willing to sanction Russia because it's a political thing to do. And when everybody starts running in a mob towards the, towards the edge of a cliff, you've got to be concerned. I, I don't see any counter, think, countervailing uh, narrative <coughs> coming out in the American media, those people are not allowed to speak. They're not, I see it in alternate media, I see it on the internet, but I don't see it in any case, in any way, shape, or form on our television, our public radio, and that's what's very disturbing. Well, do you think there's any way that we, we, generally speaking, can change what's going on? I mean, do you have any hope for the future, except the general thing that we're right, we have hope, but is there anything that can be done to change the, uh, the attitudes? I, as I said, I was just recently in New York, and even the more intellectual and, let's say, liberal-minded people have this completely negative view of Russia today, and of Putin in particular. Do you think that can be changed somehow? There are people who write uh, for, for scholarly journals and for the alternate media, internet. I see them. There's people like Stephen <coughs> Cohn. I much, I much admire him. Uh, there's people who write for Counterpunch, Consortium News, Bob Perry. Not enough. They don't get on television. Uh, but it's a two-way street, you understand. It's a two-way street. You have the same thing here. Is that true? Of course. <clears throat> very anti-American. Very... Uh, not so anti-Trump. Um, in a personal way, but you know, America, this country that uh, throws its weight around, that... Uh, uh, well, I wouldn't put them on an equal basis. I think that America <coughs> has much more power than Russia. The issue is nuclear because that it doesn't matter how much power you have. Uh, and we know that America is modernizing its nuclear armaments and spending a lot of money doing it. So this is even more tricky because we don't know where the balance is right now. Mr. Putin may know. We know that, uh, that America put a lot of missiles, anti-ballistic missiles, into uh, Poland, uh, I believe, and Romania, am I right? I forgot exactly, yeah. there's two. That's a big thing, uh, because it changes the nuclear balance. We, we know that America did it on the premise that they were, those missiles were put there to prevent Iran from threatening Europe. We know that's a bullshit cover story. They did the same thing in Korea. They put the THAAD, T-H-A-A-D, missile into South Korea, which is a very dangerous, very dangerous uh, missile system. China has uh, has been very upset with that and, and said so, but we keep saying that it's for North Korea. And we are arming, uh, uh, we are arming Japan and we're arming Korea to the teeth right now. Uh, now that you know where there, there is a legit there is a legitimate threat because north korea has said so but on the other hand we keep exercise we do war exercises on the border of north korea they're starting another one in december uh, when we know that the this aggravates the north koreans uh, to a, a maximum degree i mean there's no we're playing with fire and i and i think this is the american way now and i don't understand why we are risking our economy our way of life over such goals as what? As uh, trying to control the Ukraine, trying to regime change uh, Russia, trying to regime change North Korea, and possibly uh, trying to, try to uh, regime change China. I don't think that's a, a, a reasonable goal, but these goals are not in the, in the realm of, of reality, in my opinion. And I think we have to accept the world as it is. So I fear that it's the American uh, desire to control and change this world that makes it more dangerous. The Russian argument is not similar because 
you're not out to change uh, regimes in North Korea, much less any interest in Europe, and I don't believe you have any interest really in Ukraine. That's a messed up regime, and always was. Since you talk about these things, I have to ask you this question, otherwise I would not be doing my job. <coughs> Do you believe that the Russians, the Russian government, tried to interfere in the American elections, and if so, how successful were they? If you believe that story, I don't know. Well, I asked Mr. Putin at length, and he, he, he was very firm in his denials. He always has been. I take that at face value, like Mr. Trump does. But also, I asked him a lot of questions about cyber warfare in that fourth hour. Yes. And his answers were not as satisfying. Because cyber warfare is a very delicate issue, and, a, and it's changing day to day. I think there's a lot of things going on in that world that uh, he's not at liberty to discuss. But the American cyber warfare program is... They spent a lot of money. They formed a new cyber command. We know that they've been active, active in, in China, in Russia, in North Korea, we know that, in Iran, that was where it started. They, they attacked, we attacked Iran with Israel in 2000. We were successful in 2010 under Obama. We've been trying for a few years. So uh, we have developed cyber warfare. It's a form of, it's a weapon new form of weapon. American people don't act as if it exists, but it truly does. And the Russians know it, and I think they woke up maybe a little late. The Chinese certainly knew it, and they're very good at it, I gather. But uh, we don't know where the next war will start. In other words, there will be an attack of some kind, chaos and confusion. Blames will be, fingers will be pointed. So it's easy for the United States to say, you know, Russia did it. That's what they're doing all the time, it seems. Russia is to blame. I want to answer that question because it's important. Ever since, you know, there's this been this uh, Julian Assange of WikiLeaks revealed uh, Vault 7, it's very clear the United States CIA and NSA have the ability to imitate any country in the world, to leave its fingerprints of China or Russia or North Korea on anything. It leads me to you, you can't believe what you read. In other words, if you hear that North Korea attacks Sony Pictures, I still don't quite believe it, because I know the United States has an agenda against North Korea. But I also know that there's leaks. People are disaffected at work. There might have been a leak at Sony Pictures instead of a hack. There might easily have been a leak at the DNC, the Democratic National Convention. Why? Because the DNC was rife with corruption. Uh, Bernie, Bernie Sanders, who was the liberal socialist candidate for office and very close to uh, winning the primaries was viewed by many of the DNC as the enemy at that time. So there was a lot of malfeasance, corruption going on and it's very easy to believe that a young staffer would leak uh, those stories to uh, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. So there's always a, a, it's a reasonable scenario but it was never entertained by the United States intelligence agencies. They went right to this scenario uh, of the Russians, uh, the Russians started in influencing the election as early as 2000, uh, summer of 2016 and earlier. But none of their evidence has ever has worked. It hasn't. They haven't proven anything. In fact, the evidence that they presented on that Facebook was involved has been ridiculous. The amount of advertising, uh, much of it was after the election. It doesn't hold water. In other words, I haven't seen any one thing of any conviction. When you compare Russia to Israel, for example, or to Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia spent a fortune influencing America as much as it can. And they have somehow achieved the cooperation of the United States. Uh, Mr. Trump went to Saudi Arabia first thing and told them, uh, you know, he wanted to be in business, basically. Yes. Uh, Israel has had a strong influence on American elections for many years. Their, their lobby in the United States, you know who I'm talking about, APAC, very threatening to any congressman who votes against Israel. And as a result, the, the balance of power that existed between the United States and Israel, which was very uh, strong, a strong alliance, but it was always balanced by considerations of the feelings of other people in the Middle East and, and Russia and so forth. That has gone by the wayside now. It seems like it's an open, open, 100% uh, support Israel. 
And Mr. Trump has also furthered that notion to me. So it's, the United States has really uh, lost its position as an agitator, as a possibility of being a, a, a judge in these situations. It seems to be more of a, uh, truly a protagonist. You mentioned Julian Assange, who I had the uh, opportunity to interview some time ago. Um, and you also brought up Snowden. Uh, I saw the movie. I enjoyed it very much. But I have to ask you as an American, did you, get, did you ever have the feeling that Edward Snowden betrayed his country? He was working in a very secret area. He was in the military. And he betrayed the, that secrecy. He made it public. Do you see him as a traitor? I ask you when I know that the answer is no, because I saw the movie. You see him as a hero? Who, to you, is Edward Snowden? Well, the movie is the answer, but I, I, I see Ed. He lives here in Moscow, and I'm going to see him this trip. You're going to see him? Yeah. Uh, I, I very much admire what he did. Uh, as he says himself, he, he felt fun we fed fundamentally crossed the line uh, when we survey opened up our surveillance on everybody. And that's just not countries, it's people. And whatever, however, you know, the technicalities, it leads back into the United States. The domestic, domestic eavesdropping is going on at a, at a massive level. And always has been, frankly. It's been going on for years, since the 2001. But even before that, there was quite a bit of it. Uh, if you remember in the 1970s, the, uh, when the C, all the CIA revelations at that point, when they got Angleton, was because Angleton was, was uh, listening in on uh, with his chaos program that he was cooperating with Hoover at the FBI against the anti-war opponents of the Vietnam War. So, I mean, this, the government has violated an agreement. The government was supposed to be working for the people of the United States, but is now the boss, very much the boss. People have no say. You know, we have not adhered to the fundamentals of democracy. And Ed Snowden was an innocent, and he was a patriot of the highest order. He joined because of the 2001. Uh, he wanted to, uh, to uh, fight terrorism, but as he worked his way through these agencies, CIA and NSA, and he was also an advisor to the Defense Department, he, he found that uh, in every which way uh, we had, uh, we were not fighting terrorism. We were fighting for social and economic control. Нас проблема с микрофоном, вы слышите треск, это можно как-то исправить? Пожалуйста, обратите внимание, когда господин Стоун вот так делает головой, идет треск. Хорошо? Um, do you think he'll ever be able to go back home? I, I wish he could, I, but with Mr. Trump in office it doesn't seem likely. It's ironic because Mr. Trump at one point praised. Uh, Your microphone. Is, am I breaking uh, you're, up? You're getting uh, crackling and stuff coming. I don't know Should what I it take is. Should I take this off? Then, you can remove it. It's, how do you call it? No more dick. No. Take it off. Yeah, take it off. It goes all the way down your back. Then don't take it off afterwards. And then, <laughs> okay, so, uh, no, I wish he could go home. He's here. Uh, and he's criticized the Russian surveillance system, too. Uh, to be honest, uh, I think he's, uh, I, I've heard that he's much more relaxed now about being here. At first, he was worried about people who hurting him coming from the United States who would, but uh, I think he's adjusted. And, uh, I wish, you know, Mr. Manning was pardoned after going six years in prison. Mrs. Manning, uh, Miss Chelsea Manning. Chelsea Manning. But, uh, and I'm glad she was because she suffered greatly. But these are the people who are telling the truth. They, they should be heroes. And instead, uh, people like Mr. Clapper, the head of the intelligence, uh, Jim Clapper, 
John Brennan, uh, Michael Hayden, these are the guys who should be in jail. They have really crossed the line and they broke the Constitution and they got away with it. That's what's the problem because there's no consequences for those people who broke the law. And that goes to George Bush, Dick Cheney, people who went to war in Iraq on false pretenses and broke every international treaty in going into sovereign country. So uh, we've had a, sta a, a standard of behavior where we've broken the law and we've gotten away with it. And that encourages more and more of that kind of activity. So uh, we have the wrong people in jail and, the, and unfortunately the good people are, are living in Russia. At least Mr. Snowden is. All right, let's back and up. Mr. And Julian, don't forget to say, is in an embassy in, uh, in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Four years thus far. <clears throat> let's back up a little, back up a little bit here. Um, could you tell us, how did you get into movies? How did that happen? What brought you into the film business? I was never like this uh, back then. I learned a lot as I went. I got into the business uh, right after the Vietnam War. I came back and I went into, uh, after a few months, I went to a film school on the GI Bill at NYU, New York University. I studied film there because that was a new thing of study. It, wasn't, it didn't exist before that. It was a new field of study and uh, very, uh, young people were doing it, not many. Uh, I was very lucky in my timing because, uh, you know, I didn't, it was just unbelievable to me that you could actually go and study films, go to films in your class time and write about them or uh, even get a chance to make them in, we started with six small 16 millimeter films of about a minute, less than a minute. Uh, it, it was a process, craft, it was a craft that you learned. I studied with uh, Martin Scorsese, he was a young teacher then. I learned uh, from him, his energy was great. Uh, I went into the film world after three years, but I got nowhere. I did many jobs. I wrote eight, nine scripts, kept submitting them, get, kept getting rejections, wrote treatments. I was working in a sports film company for a while. I drove a taxi for a while. I uh, w was temporary jobs. I was a messenger. I did all kinds of work. I was married to a, a woman who helped support me. and. Uh, I eventually got a break after about seven years. Uh, seven years? Yeah, approximately, and uh, Robert Bolt, uh, the English screenwriter, you may not, Man for All Seasons, uh, Dr. Zhivago, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, he wrote those uh, screenplays. He liked the script I wrote, took me under his wing, uh, and helped me rewrite it. We didn't make that movie, it was called The Cover Up, it was about the Patty Hearst kidnapping but I remember the experience of working with Robert it really changed me and gave me made me even more sober about this business and uh, eventually uh, I had a breakthrough with Midnight Express in 1977 8 Midnight Express great movie well, thank you great movie yeah. and that's when you thank you <laughs> The, uh, the movie was a low-budget movie, did very well, and one thing after another, uh, and eventually I got to direct, uh, I was, I, I got to direct uh, The Hand, which is a horror film, I still like it, but it wasn't successful. Then I went back to writing Scarface, uh, Conan the Barbarian, The Year of the Dragon, and uh, I turned around and I did Salvador first as a writer-director. That's another great one. Thank you. Salvador. With Jimmy Woods and then Platoon in 1986. Platoon must have been based on your experience in Vietnam. It was partly based, uh, certainly the, the spirit of it. Uh, I'm not going to, 50% of it, I'd say, you know, was pretty close to what happened. But uh, what I saw in Vietnam was, again, maybe I'm seeing things, but I felt like we were fighting ourselves. I think the enemy was there, no doubt, was realistic. But I thought that, that we were, had sent over such a once a big elephant uh, to fight small, uh, a flea, basically. And we had, were overdoing it. Everything was overdone in the American sense. So as a result, there were so many casualties in that war. So many of them came from friendly fire. 
killing ourselves, somewhat like the Soviets had an experience in Afghanistan. It was a, it was a, it was a national humiliation. But it, when I came back to America, it was a, there was a period when people would not even talk about it. But when Mr. Reagan came into office in 1980, which is only about seven years after the war ended for America, uh, Reagan managed to stage the re restage the uh, Vietnam War historically as an honorable war. If you remember Reagan, correctly, you were yes. there. And I, he, uh, he said, we should not be ashamed of that war, we should be proud of it. And that mantra has now gone into the national fabric. And you hear every president says the same thing. America is an exceptional place, fights exceptional wars. Just wars. Just wars, yes. Like uh, the Augustine said. I think well, you, you were there during the Reagan era, so you, you know that was a very important change in the guard there. And while you're pouring yourself some water, I'd like to ask you about JFK. I remember when I saw that movie, I was, I was really very impressed by it. And at, point, at some point I thought, is Oliver Stone um, trying to make me believe that this is a conspiracy uh, of parts of the American government or the business elite against President Kennedy and is, is in fact even using documentary footage spliced into the body of the film to kind of get to me in ways that I can't stand up to. I can only take you through the steps. It was, as you know, I had made visceral films. I mean, uh, Midnight Express, very tactile. They hit you in the gut. And uh, Platoon certainly was there. And then I did Born on the Fourth of July, which was about a young man who was paralyzed in Vietnam. You felt Tom Cruise and you felt his paralysis. So I always had that, I was this feeling filmmaker. I believed in get behind the feeling. When I read the uh, Jim Garrison book on the trail of the assassins, uh, and uh, I met him, and, um, and then I also read other books, of course, I, I felt intuitively that Jim Garrison had lived this story. This was, and the man who wrote this book, if you read the book, and you're, you, you would recognize that he lived this story. It's not made up, it's not glamorized. He gives you his case, and it's the same book he wrote 20 years earlier. So he wrote two books that were the same story. A man doesn't do that unless he has a very strong conviction. I say this because Garrison was one of the most <sighs> criticized of figures uh, for having reopened the case, but he was the only public official who ever opened the case. The, f the story was buried right away by the FBI saying that the Lee Harvey Oswald was the assassin. All that information comes out in the first few hours of the assassination. They knew everything. Oswald was the guilty party two hours after because it was a cover story that had been set up. So once you get into this area of covert, covert warfare, covert action, it's very difficult to make an American audience understand what covert activity is because everybody believes that you act in an overt fashion. The concept of a CIA or an intelligence agency operating independently of uh, oversight and just doing what it had to do, wanted to do, it's very hard for people to understand. And I think Garrison had that problem in his case. But all the evidence on that day, all the evidence is wrong. The evidence has been besmirched compromise, stained. Uh, the best single book about it that I, uh, is not only uh, is uh, Jim D. Eugenio's Reclaiming Parkland, which I'm, which is going to be republished again. Republished. It's very important to go back and examine the information that day. Also, Jim, Jim's Douglas wrote a book called JFK and the Unspeakable, which is also crucial to the understanding of why and how. But Kennedy was a man who was moving in a new direction.
to end the Cold War with Khrushchev. Could you could you elaborate a little bit on that? What do you mean moving in a new direction? Well, so it's a pretty large story. But it's an important story. Yeah, it is a gigantic story. Uh, he was moving in this in Vietnam. He was uh, he issued a secret uh, order that was going to be revealed after the election to remove the uh, troops from Vietnam. He he knew that Vietnam was a losing proposition. It was called. I don't want to go into all the details. National Security Action Memorandum 263. The, the three days after he died, Lyndon Johnson changed it to 273 and different language. That language heightened and heightened and heightened. Within three months in 19, of his election, uh, Johnson was sending combat troops to Vietnam. He sent ultimately 525,000 combat troops. Kennedy did not have one combat troop there. He had advisors. In addition to that, Cuba, uh, Kennedy was moving towards negotiation with Castro backdoor negotiations. All this is very difficult to do when you have a cabinet uh, and uh, an administration and a, a time period when America is essentially pretty hawkish. They are, they, there, there is a feeling in the military that they were denied the, the ability to go into Vietnam that they wanted to go into Laos in 1961. 19, you know what Laos, a small country. Kennedy turned them down. Kennedy did not go into the Bay of Pigs. Now again, was a CIA operation to end Castro's rule in Cuba. Kennedy, they thought that Kennedy would support that when the Cuban troops were, the Cuban free, freedom fighters were challenged and stalled on the beaches of Cuba. He did not do that. So he took, he took actions that were against the interests of the American... Here we go again. A deep state, if you want. Also, in, uh, with Russia, he made an agreement with Khrushchev in 1963 for nuclear overground testing, atmospheric testing, the, the peace treaty on nuclear weapons. Also his famous speech at American University. Well, that was a speech, yeah. The speech comes on the heels of that. But that peace treaty was an amazing first step. It was like Gorbachev and Reagan. Tremendous importance. In so many ways, uh, Kennedy was moving to end the Cold War, to get America off this path of spending more and more money that Eisenhower had warned about. The military-industrial complex. Yes which uh, haunts us all. And by the way, you said earlier, uh, Russia, you have your hardliners here. Can you tell me a little bit more about why, what, what you mean here in this country? Where the pressure is coming from? Because I've heard candidate, uh, Russian candidates for president are more nationalistic than, than Mr. Putin. A lot of, you know, I think, uh